Welcome everyone, my name is Jack Rico and you're listening to episode 4 of Highly Relevant with Jack Rico. This is the podcast where I interview the people and discuss the moments that are shaping our American and Latino pop culture. In this episode, I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with none other than Willie Geist, one of NBC News' biggest stars and one of the most likable men on morning television. We discuss his new Sunday Today show, Soccer in America, Hip Hop, and the Art of Interviewing. And if you haven't seen the Obama's first date movie, South Side With You, I have its director Richard Tanney to talk about the inspiration in making this movie, John Legend's involvement, and if the Obamas have already seen the film. And if you love movies, get ready to see Hollywood's best films of the year at a theater near you. Notable New York film critic and my good friend Wilson Morales joins me to do my fall movie preview as we select our must-see films. That and a recap of the most important bicultural pop culture news you might have missed this week. On a beautiful day here in New York, I'm Willie Geist along with Natalie Morales. If you've ever woken up early and turned on NBC, you most likely will have seen my next guest. A New York Times bestselling author and a ubiquitous television presence on NBC, Willie Geis is a throwback to the gentleman anchors of yesteryear. The combination of his calm demeanor and quick wit has made him a sought-after commodity in morning television, a protean host who showcases equal comfort with hard politics as with light pop culture fare. He has a new show on Sunday mornings called Sunday Today with Willie Geist and joins me now on the podcast. Hey Jack, how's it going man? Willie, what's going on brother? Good to talk to you. Are you hey, wearing man. a green jacket or a red jacket <laughs> as we speak? <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm just wearing a simple shirt today, uh, this morning. What? So <laughs> That's a huge letdown. Huge letdown. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't be that guy all the time, man. I need a break sometimes. You know, my jackets need a break too. I think. <laughs> Best dressed man on the Today Show every time he steps on the set. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and uh, and sharing some of your uh, your knowledge and and your insights on on TV and everything. Um, first of all, congrats on Sunday today, Willie. Thank you. Thanks. We're having a good time. It's um, we're, we've sort of had a soft launch over the summer which means we haven't told the world about it yet. And then we're going to kind of bust out of the gate in the next couple of weeks. But it's been great. The idea was to do something that was a little longer in form than your typical Today Show, meaning when you see an interview with a politician or a movie star or a musician or a CEO, on right. a weekday Today Show, it's you know it can be three and a half, four minutes. On our show, we're doing seven and a half or eight minutes. So you get a little deeper conversation, um, news analysis, in the first part of the show, we got a round table of smart, younger people that, that we think people ought to be hearing from that you don't normally see on the Today Show or on TV. And uh, so we're just trying something new, and NBC's given us some good latitude to sort of do a 2.0 version of the Today Show and, and see how it goes. I love that. How did the opportunity present itself to you? Uh, well, you know, I was... Uh, I guess I thought I needed another job on top of the, <laughs> doing my daily Today Show and the Morning Joe and all the other things I've lost track of. Um, I just thought it'd be, you know, I'm always looking for, for real estate to try new things. I started uh, in 2009. I did a half-hour show at 5.30 a.m. on MSNBC that led into Morning Joe, which starts at 6 a.m. And it was, again, a, like a laboratory where I could kind of do whatever I wanted and that is write so the cool. show and produce the show and do the things I wanted to do. And um, that this came up through, you know, NBC said, well, what about Sunday morning? You know, we'd love to try something on Sunday morning. So as you know, when you get a piece of real estate, particularly on network television, you grab it and figure out what you want to do with it. You know how late night television uh, today specifically is a throwback to like the variety shows of the 50s? Well, I think your show feels like a modern throwback to those news magazines of the 70s that I've loved so much. How difficult, oh, how difficult is it to get the identity and the voice of the show right off the bat? Yeah, it's. I think what you have to do is trust your voice and your identity and that they gave you the show because they wanted to hear your voice and your identity. So I just came out and did all the things I thought would be good. I did, you know, I came up with a list of people I'd love to profile and they're people you probably aren't going to hear from on other channels or other days of the week for eight minutes on a Sunday morning. I did um, an incredible interview with Ice Cube that was like one of the highlights of my career. Man. I did um, the first show was Leslie Odom Jr. who played Burr in Hamilton when he was still. I saw in his it. I saw the there. show. Yeah. Yeah. So we're to, you know, and I'm getting to do CEOs. You know, I love story. I love the story of the journey. How did you get where you are? So we did 
the four guys who started a business school project and it became Warby Parker, the eyeglass company that's now a mm-hmm. you know billion dollar business. I just love hearing the stories of how people got where they are, hopefully inspiring some people. Um, Why do you like that subject matter so way. much, Willie? I think because we've all been there and we're all hoping we'll get somewhere and we want to know how other people did it. And I think it's refreshing and a good reminder to hear that even the biggest stars in the world, even Ice Cube, even Luke Bryan, who we did on the other end of the spectrum in country music, had stumbles and had moments where they thought, I think this isn't going to work. I got to go figure out what else to do. I think every one of those conversations I've had on the show since April when we started, there's been a point in the person's life or career where they've been to the point where they said, this isn't working. I can't pay my bills this way. I'm never going to get what I want to do. I guess I'll go do something else. And Ice Cubes, I think he was going to be an architectural drafter. He was like, he really into drawing. Um, other people said, well, maybe I'll just be a songwriter. I'll never be the guy up on the stage. But they got breaks and they worked hard and they stayed with it and um, they made it. So I think it's kind of inspirational to people. Uh, You and I know each other from the Today Show for almost about three years now or so, and you've always struck me to be a bit of a renaissance man. Um, How (laughs) much preparation goes into being Willie Geist? Uh, Well, it's a lot of waxing, a lot of body (laughs) waxing. It starts there. Not a hair on my body except for my head. (laughs) Manscaping a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, you've got to start clean, Jack. As you know, you've got that clean dome. Uh, so once that's once that's taken care of, I'm good and, good and clean. Uh, on the that's more on the personal tip. Oh, was that not what you were asking? Okay, on the professional side. Um, well, you know, I I kind of have a double life because Morning Joe is deep political analysis in the weeds. So for that, you know, it's an ongoing 24 hour a day thing where you're looking at your phone and you're reading stories and Trump said this today and Hillary Clinton just responded that way. And you kind of have to know what's going on and you wake up in the morning and you read in and you figure out what the important things will be to talk about. And so for me, that's an ongoing preparation. Today's show is more specific. The next day you might have a movie star um, that you don't know a ton about. So you've got to watch his movie or watch her movie and read up on him a little bit. So to me, the the preparation there is, is very specific in that you know the four or five people you're going to be talking about and you just read up on them and get to know who they are and try to put on a good show where Morning Joe is just sort of absorbing everything that's happening in the political sphere over the last 24 hours. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a particular subject that that that, that that I, I've always happened to like. Every time I saw television, there was always somebody that influenced me so much. And one of the things that influenced me a lot was the interviewer. And I wanted to yeah. talk to you about the erosion of the interviewer. There's a massive absence of it now that, on late night in particular, now that David Letterman has left. And yeah. I wanted to know if you have noticed that. I know, I know morning television has a lot of great interviewers and and things like that. But I think overall television, the art of interviewing has really eroded. What, what do you think that is? And what do you think one has to do to become a great interviewer? Well, I think part of it is what we value now in our media culture is having a take. You can't just be the guy asking a question and listening. What's your take? You know, you've got to have a hot take that's going to get picked up and go viral and get a lot of likes and hits. And if you read Twitter, everybody's got a take on everything that's happening every minute of the day. That's not necessarily my personality. I mean, I've got thoughts on things and I express them all the time on the Today Show and I do it on Morning Joe. But I, honest to God, am more interested in listening to people. And that's why I love doing these longer interviews on Sunday today. And I would love at some point to do what Charlie Rose does, which is he just sits at a table with a black curtain behind him and talks to somebody for an hour. It's the most minimalistic thing. It's the most intimate, personal, minimalistic thing. You know, you'd have a guy like Charlie Rose after all this time say, hey, give me a big studio. But he prefers that silent touch. It's almost like he has a jazz band in the back, you know? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And it's that intimacy. And I think, obviously, because of his reputation, too, people trust him. But I find also there's, when you watch interviews now, there's this instinct to ask a question let the person talk for a little bit and then jump it with some take or some interruption, which is fine if you're interviewing a politician and you know, you've know you got an obligation to poke and prod them a little bit. But I find letting people answer and then following up and listen, like actually listen. If you go in with an agenda, you're not listening. You know, you're going to, you're going to ask a question and then 
push that person to where you think the conversation would should go. I am genuinely interested in hearing what Ice Cube has to say about our culture. I'm genuinely interested in hearing what Sebastian Younger, the great author and, and filmmaker, has to say about our military and the way we treat vets. Like I, The beautiful thing about Sunday is we pick profiles of people who I want to talk to. So I get to sit with them for a day, a couple hours in many cases, and have real conversations with them. Top three interviewers you've ever seen. Matt's great. Matt Lauer. Matt he, Lauer is great, man. He can just throw he throw darts at people. <laughs> I love Bob Costas. Uh, Costas is good. Yeah. Oprah. Brian mm-hmm. Gumbel. Mm-hmm. David Letterman. And believe it or not, Alec yeah. Baldwin. He, he, Baldwin's good. You know who else I would throw in that mix? And it might hit you weird at first. Howard Stern is a oh, great interviewer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Howard Stern is a great interviewer. And part of that is when you walk into the studio with Howard Stern, you know everything's on the table. So if I ever asked any of these celebrities anything he has asked them, they'd never come back on the show. You think you're, this is the Today Show. It's the context of where you are. They go in, and by being in that room, they're implicitly signing a contract that says, Anything goes in this room, but he gets them to open up. He and he's always done it. He's been doing it for thirty some years. I don't he know how he gets does people it. to say the thing they wouldn't say anywhere else. I love a Howard Stern interview. I always love Dave's interview. I'll tell you who's who's surprisingly good is um, if you watch comedians in cars getting coffee, Jerry Seinfeld. And I think part of that is he's on the level of everyone else that he's interviewing. So if he's the only guy who could get David Letterman to sit down and spill his gut. Because of the trust factor. Career. Because it's trust. You've been there. You're as famous as I am. We're, you're as rich as I am. We're on the same boat. I'll talk to you. So those, I think those are fun interviews to watch, too. I think any interview where you learn something new or you see a side of the subject that you don't get everywhere else, on every interview, on every entertainment show, on every morning show, and everywhere else, I think you've done something good. And that's why having seven and a half or eight minutes was so important to me on the Sunday show, because I can pull that out of people. And not just to have to ask them about the movie they're in or the album that they're releasing, but to ask them about their story. Now, you read a lot in order to be well prepared for work, but what happens on your personal time? What interests do you lean towards? Do you have a favorite subject matter that appeals to you most than others when you're at home? Yeah, I love I, I love history books. I, I feel like I don't have enough time to read nonfiction anymore. So the the truth is in the little amount of time I have free, I've got a nine year old and a seven year old. I'm with them. You know, I'm, I, I, you gotta be there at night as much as you can. And certainly on the weekends as much as I can. But if I'm not with them, um, I love history. I love music. I love sports. And I think those are all nice departures from the things that I'm ensconced in, you know, 18 hours a day at work. Um, if I can get home at night, the last thing I want to do, and it's no disrespect to any channel, I don't want to sit and watch people talk about politics because that's what I've been doing and reading about all day. I'll put on a Yankee game and it just takes, <laughs> it just takes you out of it. Or you put on a great album and just take yourself out, take your, let your brain rest a little bit and do something that sort of asks nothing of you intellectually, but that feels good to, to do and watch. And but tr- the truth of the matter is if I've got free time, I'm, I'm with my kids as much as possible. Speaking of sports, I know you're a big sports fan. Uh, you and I have spoken sports a little bit. How are you with soccer? You know what? I never really played the game, to be honest. I was a football player most of my life. I tried it. I think in like third, fourth grade, I played. I wasn't very good. It just wasn't something I ever watched or paid attention to. I have nothing against soccer. I just, when you don't grow up with it and you don't appreciate the beauty and you don't appreciate the skill that it takes to to play, it's just, it's not my thing. I'm not a hater. It's just, I'm a football guy. I went to an SEC school. So football is my thing in that season. Um, but it's, you know, when there's a world cup or something, I totally get it. I love everything surrounding the game. I love the patriotism, the enthusiasm, this, a world tournament. That's like the kind of thing you dreamed about as a kid, these countries colliding on a field. And so I love all the trappings of the game. I just, I've never fully gotten into the actual the actual game itself. Why do you think Americans still haven't embraced soccer the way the rest of the world has? Uh, you know, I've been hearing now for, I don't know, two generations, or maybe it's just one generation, that this generation is going to propel soccer to being number one in the United States. And I think maybe as football, the dangers of football become more apparent to students, to parents, that they're going to 
push their kids into soccer instead of football. Maybe that happens. I, I don't know. But I think America loves football so much. And it's we're reminded through all these controversies, through the CTE, through Ray Rice, all these things where people said, you know what, we're walking away from the game. These the preseason numbers this year. I just saw them last week. The like for a preseason game, rate higher than the you know Eastern Conference Finals in the NBA. It's just people love football. They just do. Um, but so I don't know. Maybe this is the generation. But I've we've been waiting a long time for it to become the number one sport in the country, and it hasn't quite broken through for whatever reason. Let's talk some Knicks because the Nets. Who? <laughs> uh, I know. Right? What are you? What are you thinking of this new uh, Knicks revamp lineup? Derrick Rose at point guard, Mello at forward, Porzingis, Noah. How deep can we go, and can we really challenge LeBron or, or really anybody? I I think I mean listen it's as good a team on paper as we've had probably since the Ewing years. I mean even the even the 98 team that went to the finals that was kind of fluky. Remember they were the 8 seed, they had Sprewell and and Allen Houston and they made a run. Lucky to the finals, shots, but, man, that whole season. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't I wouldn't call that a great team and it was, you know, that it was um it was a strike shortened season and all those other things that come along with it. But so to me this is the best paper lineup that we've had in a long time. And it's exciting. I mean, it's, it's terrible that the Knicks have stunk this long. You've got Madison square garden. You've got a city that loves hoops. They were dying for a winner, dying to be competitive even. So I think you got to tip your cap to the organization for going out and getting these guys. I mean, will Rose be healthy? I think that's the question. Hopefully his knees hold up and all the other parts of his body that we worry about. Porzingis was a blast last year. He's only going to get better. Hopefully he'll get a little bit stronger. Obviously, Mello. I think Mello is a really interesting case to me. He's I remember for a long time it was like this is the guy who can't win. He's sort of a a black hole when he gets the ball. He's, right, like, he's, right. he's sort of like morphed into you know when he won the gold medal a couple of weeks ago and he was crying after the game and it's just how much it meant to him. He's become like this great sort of statesman of the the NBA. So I think I I hope he gets a run at a title before he's done. And Joe Kim Noah helps obviously. So. I I don't know. We're not. I wouldn't say we're in Cleveland's league just yet, but I wouldn't be shocked if they went to the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, what's your relationship with social media, Willie? How do you use it, and how? What purpose does it serve in your particular life? You know, I use Twitter a lot. I use Twitter a lot, and honestly, I use it as a news feed. I follow all the news organizations, left, right, and center, reporters covering the presidential campaign. Um, and it's a really quick, easy way for me to keep up with everything. You know, you scroll through and it's a news feed and you click on the things you think are valuable. It's, it's, it helps me not have things fall through the cracks. So if I'm on the I'm sitting right. on morning, Joe, yes, I read that piece that we're going to talk about, or yes, I heard that take that's so controversial or, and also, you know, it checks you if you're, you know, you'll say something on the air and somebody will say, well, wait a minute, this happened yesterday to sort of contradict what you said, or here's what the Clinton campaign actually says about that. There, It's a way, It's a to me, it's a nice catch-all for everything that's happening. Snapchat, Instagram, Periscope, I just feel there's so many of them. You, you, you seem to not connect with those as much as you do with Twitter. Why is that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think I feel like life is busy enough if I'm spending time on 15 different platforms when my kids are sitting right there. It's not something I need to be doing. I use Instagram, you know, if uh, I don't use it constantly, I probably don't even use it every day, but uh, you know, I'll put up a picture if I feel it's warranted. I also have this weird thing. Maybe it's because my parents are from the Midwest and it's the way I was taught. Like nobody cares. I mean, nobody wants to hear about the (laughs) salad you had for lunch. You know, it's just like, I feel, I I understand you got to connect and I get all those things. And I've started to do Snapchat a little bit too, but I just have this, some some voice in my head telling me this isn't you. No nobody wants to know what you did today. Nobody cares that you're going to be on this show tonight. Stop it. So <laughs> I have to probably get past that to be fully engaged in social media. A few more questions. Uh, I heard you love hip hop, and I heard that Boys in the Hood was a major influence in your life. How did you get? I mean, I look at you, and the last thing I'm thinking, Willie, is that you love <laughs> hip hop. Seriously. I. You don't see NWA when you look at me? That's not cool, <laughs> thug life. I have a thug life cat. It's amazing. <laughs> How did that happen? Who did you meet? What, what, did you live in a particular... How did hip-hop become such a big part of your life? 
I grew up in Bergen County, New Jersey, which is about 30 minutes across the river from New York City. And um, it was the late 80s, early 90s, when I was in middle school and starting in high school, when hip hop was starting to leak out to the suburbs and becoming more mainstream, you know, with, you know, yes, Run DMC and Beastie Boys and all those crossover, but NWA as well, Big Daddy Kane, um, OPP, you know, that was a huge song that was when Naughty by Nature was from New Jersey. Yep. And there was a show, uh, a cable access show, really, or a local show called Video Music Box. Of course I remember that. Yeah. Of okay, course. So that was, like, that was a, like a New York staple, man. That was the thing. So uh, we came home, a group of uh, me and some of my buddies, and we would run home from school and we watched every day. We'd get a bag of Crunchers barbecue potato chips and Dr. <laughs> Peppers, and we would sit. And it was in the day when, you know, things were not, media was not on demand for you. You couldn't go to YouTube and watch oh, what you wanted when you wanted. So you'd sit for an hour and hope that the video you love, whether it was Rob Bass or, or my one of my favorite hip-hop songs of all time, The Symphony, which was a posse cut with uh, Marley Marl, Big Daddy Kane was in it. So oh, like man, you would that's just way back. See that, you'd hope to see that video, and if you didn't, you'd go, damn, I guess we got to watch again tomorrow. Um, so I just, I don't know, I got the bug. I think um, another part of it was I played basketball my whole life, and that was sort of just like in the background of the culture there. I was on a lot of AAU teams um, where I would be one of two white kids in the 80s and early 90s and traveled with these guys who became my good friends. And um, it was what we were listening to, and I would hear new acts from them, and you know, I'd share stuff with them. And so I think it was... Um, it was a time when hip hop was growing up and and moving out of urban centers and out into the suburbs and becoming more mainstream and it was it was exciting it was fun it's funny i did you ever see mark ronson's ted talk on hip hop sampling no i haven't seen that I didn't oh watch it. dude you have to watch it it is excellent the dude's a bit of a music historian you know and that's yeah. one of the things that kind of took me aback cuz you look at him and I mean, he's now like this throwback to like a 50s type of, uh, you know, uh, rock and roll guy. But but yeah. he's so all about hip hop. He talks about Slick Rick and how supposedly he's the fifth most sampled artist of all time. James Brown being number one. The TV shows that, are, for example, I'm watching now are The Get Down, which has a lot of like the, the birth of hip hop. Have you been watching The Get Down? No, but people are telling me I've got to watch it. I've, I've got it in the old... Uh... In the old queue, I've got to get get to it. Are you binging on anything? You know what I started last night was the night of, but we got into it on HBO. Which How did you like it? Is, is amazing. Well, I, I got, we got twenty minutes into it, and it was like before we were going to bed, and my wife was like, "I, I can't do this. It's too much." <laughs> She's like, "I'm going to bed right now. I'm not. I can't get this invested and watch people like stabbing each other." So. I have to I have to watch it again when she's not around. You should watch Stranger <laughs> Things. It's more of a I heard that one too. I heard that one too. Quick shout out to your father, Bill Geist. To me, you guys are like the Ken Griffey Senior and Junior of television. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's great. You never know. I'd love to see you two guys together on one show. Maybe it's the Sunday Today show. You never know. If I can get him to retire fully and not be in the pocket of CBS, maybe we'll make it happen. All right. Thank you so much, Willie, for being on the podcast. Talk to you soon, my man. Jack, thanks for having me. Take care. You can catch Willie on NBC's Sunday Today with Willie Geist, live from 8 to 9 in the morning Eastern Time, and also see him weekdays on Today and MSNBC's Morning Joe. Before we move on to our next interview, I'd like to take a moment and give respects to two legends that died this week, Mexican singer Juan Gabriel and actor Gene Wilder. Gabriel died this past August 28th of a heart attack at age 66 and left a legacy of stage showmanship and unforgettable love ballads. Even President Obama paid his respects. Wilder passed at age 83 on August 29th from Alzheimer's and was considered one of America's greatest comic actors. Some of his best movies were Stir Crazy, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, and Willy Wonka. Let's take a listen at both of their iconic careers. Abrázame que el tiempo hiere y el cielo es testigo Que el tiempo es cruel y a nadie quiere Por eso te digo, te digo, te digo. Abrázame muy fuerte amor Manténme así a tu lado Como quisiera Que tú vivieras Que tus ojitos jamás se hubieran cerrado nunca y estar mirándolos. 
vida Hazlo por quien más quieras tú Yo quiero ver de nuevo luz en todo If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. You're putting me on. No matter what you hear in there, no matter how cruelly I beg you, do not open this door. Get me out. Let me out of here. Get me the hell out of here. Come with me and you'll be in a world of your imagination take a look and you'll see into your imagination up next my interview with director Richard Tanney from Southside with you Michelle thought it wasn't a date it isn't Going to an awful lot of trouble for just another smooth talking brother. So, what's this boy's name? Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Richard Tanney's the writer, director, and producer of the new romance film Southside with You, based on the first date the Obamas had. Thank you very much, Richard, for being on the podcast today. My pleasure. So, how does a film like this work? Uh, South Side of You, did you get inside access to speak directly to the Obamas to research the film? No, no, it was it was it was like the complete opposite. Actually, I, I wrote the movie in in 2013, um, sitting in my in my father's house in Roseland, New Jersey. Um, and you know, uh, you know, I'm a nobody now. I was a nobody then. I, I didn't have any any access. Um, it was just uh, doing as much research as I could, and you know, doing my homework, and um, and then kind of uh, extrapolating from there, and um, you know hoping that I was getting at the essence of, of the two characters. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the first thing I thought of when I saw the trailer and that a movie about Michelle and Barack Obama's first date was being made was, did they consent to this? Was there right legal rights that you had to go through? No. Um, you know, they, they, they are, uh, because they're public figures, um, you know, you you can you can use them in in literature or film. Um, you can you know you can use their name and likeness. So it's like public um, domain almost. It's yeah, it, it's exactly what it is. Now, any public figure has the has the ability to uh, you know to sue you for slander or or um, you know anything that anything that's inaccurate. Um, and but the the truth of the matter is is that it's a it's a it's a very flattering portrait, um, and I, I was drawing largely from uh, uh, biogra- you know, established biographical facts. Um, now, the dialogue itself is completely imagined because there was, there was not a note taker, but the things that they express about their families, about their childhood, about their uh, you know, uh, 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 their experiences on the whole are, are, are taken from things that they've talked about or that have, you know, been written about them. And when I say it's a flattering portrait, I, I say that because doing the research, um, it, it would, you'd be hard pressed to come away from, from le- reading about them and learning about them, um, and not taking away, um, you know, sort of a flattering uh, perspective of, of who, who they right. were now, at the time in their lives. Do life. you know if they've seen the film, if they got a cut of the film? Uh, what are their thoughts on this? Have you heard anything from them regarding this film? Uh, John Legend is one of our executive producers, and, and he was saying today that he had a conversation with them about it, they're aware of it, um, and that the invitation is definitely there for them to watch it whenever they have a chance. And I, you know, I just sort of think, look, they're, they're the two busiest people on, on, on the planet. Um, so, you know, what, hopefully one day they'll, they'll get around to it and, and they'll, uh, 
they'll get a kick out of it. You know, John Legend, as you said, is an executive producer for the film. How involved is he really in the day-to-day? I'm always very fearful when I see celebrity executive producers on credits because it always seems like like a, such a vanity front at first. Well, you know, in, 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 this, in this instance, John actually... Uh, he he saw the movie after I uh, finished cutting it. Um, it was still it, it still had a lot of post production to go in terms of score and and, and, and other boring post production things. But um, um, he he was he was really inspired by the movie, and he he went and wrote an original song, um, and and uh, that song plays over the end credits. It's going to be on his new album. It's called Start, and he also was has been instrumental, um, in, in lending the movie support. And, you know, that is, uh, that, that contribution really can't be downplayed when you're, when you're dealing with a movie that cost a million and a half dollars and doesn't have any, uh, marquee names. Um, so, you know, so, so his involvement, I think is, is, has been critical to the movie getting, uh, you know, a, a, an awareness, not to mention his artistic contribution as a songwriter. I heard the film took 18 days to shoot, and it's also 84 minutes long. I mean, that's pretty short for almost any feature today. Why the short duration? Well, the, the movie actually took 17 days to film, um, and 15 of those were uh, were principal photography days, and then two days were pickups, just, just in case you're interested in any of that. Uh, nuts and bolts type of stuff. Uh, so it was a very expedited shoot, and that has to do with you know the limited amount of resources that we had, and time is money. Um, and uh, and as far as the short running time, um, you know, I, I think before sunset, which which uh, which is certainly you know something that that I uh, really admire, and, and and the whole before trilogy, I think that's eighty two minutes. Right. Um, and, 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 and a movie like that, you know, it just, it just shows you that you don't have to outstay your welcome. You know, you, there, you, can, you can go right up to the line and do just enough to get the job done um, without overstaying your welcome. Speaking of Richard Linklater movies, were there any other movies or directors that influenced you in creating sort of this visual style and feel for South Side of You? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Linklater um, was sort of the gateway drug for me, um, to Eric Romer, uh, the French, oh, wow. uh, filmmaker so going, like, came out of the new wave deep into the French catalog <laughs> of directors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and, but this is, you know, years ago when, when, you know, when I was a teenager and, and kind of really getting, getting into, uh, foreign filmmakers and, and, and link later, probably reading an interview with him, uh, about before sunrise or, 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 uh, or, or, or possibly even, um, what else was he doing at that time? You know, maybe maybe a movie like Tape um, that was dialogue driven. But whatever it was, he referenced Romer as kind of the creator of the walk and talk movie. And so, you know, definitely movies like The Green Ray and My Night at Mods and 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 Summer. Um, you know, um, just just not being afraid to uh, to to dwell in a moment and to focus on the mundane. Um, so th- th- those were definitely uh, influences, and then and then in terms of style, um, we we worked really hard to try to nail down a uh, a look that would uh, fit in with movies made in the mid to late '80s. So we didn't have a lot of money to recreate the period, um, and and to create that kind of you know cars lining the block spectacle. Um, uh, so what what I wanted to do is to to sort of orient the viewer to to 1989 with that kind of heightened naturalism, that hazy kind of uh, gauzy cinematography that you might see in an Adrian Lin movie like Fatal Attraction mm-hmm. or Flashdance, right. that you might see in in some of Tony or Ridley Scott's work in the 80s, um, Jonathan Demme. Um, there was just there was a style of cinematography that was coming from uh, coming over from 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 the UK um, with those guys. And uh, it really got co-opted by, by Hollywood and, and uh, we worked, we worked hard to kind of get it back. August 26 as a release date. I, I mean, I think a love story of this nature would crush it on Valentine's day, Richard. <laughs> I think, I think the, uh, the calculation there was, uh, well, they, they, so the distributor bought the movie, um, the distributor bought the movie 
probably a few weeks before Valentine's Day 2016. So, you know, it definitely wasn't going to be able to get out for this year's Valentine's Day. And I think um, they rightly wanted to release the movie while the president was still holding office. Um, so in that sense, because it's a summer movie and because there, there, there's been a, a lot of bigger kind of action superhero movies coming out this summer, I this think they, programming, right? they determine... Yeah, yeah, and just that it might be kind of a, a, a nice change of pace at the end of the summer. You know, a, a lot of people have said that August, the month of August in Hollywood, has always been sort of a dumping ground for bad movies. But that's really changing. Florence Foster Jenkins is coming out this month along with Sausage Party, which is everybody's raving about in terms of comedy. Pete's Dragon, Hell or High Water, I mean, now Side Side of You. How do you feel about August as a month uh, that a lot of people dismiss. Do you feel it's like a really good time now to put movie good movies out? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I if I believe in any of uh, the release date conventions. I mean, um, when when did Batman versus Superman come out? I think that came out at a at an unusual time for a, a massive blockbuster, and and obviously like March, you know, that yeah. that movie didn't. Yeah, it was March. I mean, so so I, I think I think that. Um, for me, it, it it maybe sometimes has less to do with with the actual release date and just you know does does the movie have a clear runway? Um, you know, are you programming it against the right type of competition? So, look for me personally, this is my first film. Um, I we're getting a nationwide release with over eight hundred screens opening weekend for you know a million and a half dollar movie. So I just feel humbled and grateful that that we're we're getting a real. Uh, bona fide theatrical release in an age where that's hard to do as an independent movie. So, you know, if they told me January or September, you know, uh, um, you know, that, that would have been okay too. And, and, um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I think they're being smart about it and they're, they're definitely, they're definitely putting, putting their, uh, their, their, their full weight behind it, Roadside and Miramax. How, so I'm, I'm happy about that. How much pressure is there for you as a first time writer director of a film of this nature for you to, hit it out of the ballpark on your first try is it like your career on the line here yeah i mean i think i think your career is probably always on the line anytime you sit down to write something and 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 direct something um uh i don't know because this is the really the first time at bat um uh in in terms of making a movie but um i uh I don't know. I don't. I don't feel pressure. Maybe I. Maybe I should. Um, maybe. Maybe I should have felt more pressure. Um, I, what I should say is, I don't feel pressure um, from the industry to succeed. Uh, the, the pressure that I I have felt has been self-imposed. You know, I I I, I just You're always want to do my best. Yeah, I, I'm very detail-oriented, and so whether it was writing the script whether it was raising the money, whether it was actually shooting for those 17 days in, in, in Chicago last July. Um, I'm just trying to put my everything and my all into, uh, into the movie. And, uh, you know, I think that's a good kind of pressure and it's a good challenge. Um, so yeah, everything that comes afterwards, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit less concerned about. Last question, uh, Richard, uh, Parker Sawyer's man, this guy is Obama. <laughs> I mean, he has his <laughs> essence. Uh, did you know immediately as soon as you saw him that this was your lead Barack Obama protagonist? And what was the audition like with him? No, I didn't know. And the reason why is because he lives in the UK. And so he sent a, an audition tape in. He's an American, but he lives overseas. Um, he sent an audition tape in. And the tape was a, a, a full on, you know, Saturday Night Live level impersonation of Commander in Chief, oh, wow. the President. <laughs> and, and now the resemblance was uncanny. Um, so I, I, I called him because I wanted to give him notes so he could do uh, another tape. Um, and I just said, look, get, get the President out of your mind. You're just a guy trying to get a girl and uh, bring more of yourself to the text, just play the character on the page, not the guy you see on the news every night. So he totally got it. And uh, I was just kind of praying that night before the new tape came in that he was going to nail it because, um, he, he certainly looked right. You know, there was nobody who looked more like the president than he did. So if he could act it 
and do it naturally and not be a mimic, but be, but be a real performer, um, I knew we were golden. And then sure enough, the tape came in and, and he was extraordinary. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I think that his performance is a little deceptive because you walk away from it feeling like you just witnessed young Obama and, or that's wow. at least what a lot of people tell me. It's certainly the way, it's certainly the way that I feel. Um, and like you just said, he is Obama, but the thing is, is he's not, he, 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 he certainly, certainly shares a lot of, uh, qualities, but he's just an amazing actor. And that's what he was able to do with this role. So, you know, I just think that this doesn't even really, um, Ex- express what he's fully capable of because you know it, it's it's always going to be connected to the real life person but to get there and to do it and to pull it off the way he did is is actually indicative of of just how talented the guy is richard thank you for being on the podcast thank you so much i really appreciate your time it's time for jacked in Let's begin with some movie news. Mexican actress Ana de la Reguera will be joining the cast of Everything Everything starring the up-and-coming young actors Nick Robinson and Amanda Stenberg. George Clooney will be directing a new dramedy called Suburbicon which will star Matt Damon and Julianne Moore and will be written by the Coen brothers. And Richard Linklater is preparing a star-studded film with Brian Cranston, Steve Carell, and Lawrence Fishburne. Switching over to TV, the longtime host of CBS This Morning, Charles Osgood, will be retiring from the program after 22 years at the network. His final broadcast as anchor will be in late September. No successor was named, but I've been hearing Jane Pauley is leading the pack of candidates. HBO Latino has a new special called Habla y Volta, premiering September 16th at 7 p.m. Fox's Empire adds one of America's favorite moms, Felicia Rashad, to the cast in a recurring role and Netflix renews Stranger Things for season two. Yes. Over to music, Selena Gomez is taking a career hiatus after being diagnosed with lupus. We wish her a quick recovery. Ringo Starr's first copy of the White Album has officially become the most expensive record ever sold at auction for a whopping $790,000. Now, come on, does he really need the money? The Latin American Music Awards 2016 nominees were announced this past Tuesday with reggaetonero Yandel leading the pack with six nominations. Nicky Jam and Enrique Iglesias with five apiece and Jay Balvin with four. The show will air October 6 on Telemundo. In tech news, TV streaming app Molotov is now available on the iPhone. Also, Apple showed off the first Siri-powered apps arriving in iOS 10. And hey, did you know you can now zoom in on Instagram pictures and videos? I discovered this accidentally the other day and I have to say, Renee Zellweger barely has any wrinkles. And we'll finish off with Broadway news that Baz Luhrmann's movie musical Moulin Rouge is being developed as a new stage musical. No opening venue has been announced. Up next, my fall movie preview. But if you're not too busy, head over to showbizcafe.com and watch my New York One review of Matthew McConaughey and Naomi Watts' The Sea of Trees. I was seriously not trying to rip it apart. Kidding. Not kidding. This is probably one of the worst movies of the year, unfortunately, and I think it, it has to do with uh, two men uh, that are suicidal, and they go into a forest in Mount Fuji, and unfortunately, one of them doesn't appear to be the person that they happen to be. All this with like about 20 plots that never really interconnect, and one of the worst problems here is the script, but Matthew McConaughey is sterile. One of the worst performances he's done in a quite some time. Gus Van Sant, I don't know what he was thinking. The script was all over the place. Time to talk movies and joining me to evaluate what you must see for this fall is the editor-in-chief of BlackFilm.com and former vice president of the African American Film Critics Association, Wilson Morales. And did I mention All Around Nice Guy? Wilson, thanks for jumping on the podcast. Hi, how's it going? Um, Pretty good, man. Thanks, uh, you know, uh, for being here. I'm really excited about the fall movie preview, uh, especially talking to you. But before we get into all these great movies that uh, people have to go see, talk to me about BlackFilm.com. Well, I'm the editor at BlackFilm.com. We've been around since 1998, 99. That's how long it's been. Uh, basically, you know, we cover all films, all genres, um, with a specific focus on black talent, not just African Americans, black talent uh, in front of the screen and behind the screen. Because of the fact that, you know, Hollywood waits 10 years before they notice anyone on the mainstream level. So we want to give them their due while they're working now and not say we're discovering them years down the road. All right, so let's talk about your top five that you're really excited about to share with the audience. 
you know, as I looked at the list as far as what's coming out throughout the year, what are people seeing or what they want to see? I think the first thing that comes out and it's going to start out in September is the Magnificent Seven. Yeah, you know, this is like an, like, it just feels like a remake. It feels like an old Western with a nice little cast. Why does this have like Oscar uh, hopes to attach to it in your mind? The Magnificent Seven was about 60 years ago. Uh, it's a classic film, but today's generation is not watching it. It's, unless you're watching it on the AMC, no one's going out to buy the DVD or play it on the big screen. You know, I think half the cast is dead. There's not all of them. Um, and what you have is this new take directed by Antoine Fuqua, uh, starring Denzel Washington, Chris Pratt. People want to see uh, Bag them Up, Shoot them Up. Um, I've seen the film. It works. You don't necessarily need to compare this to the original film. I think it stands alone as it is. And Do I think, you think it has sort of the... Is it more like uh, Quentin Tarantino's Hateful Eight, sort of in that, in that sort of vibe? Better. So this is better than The Hateful Eight? Better from a commercial standpoint. I think, you know, Quentin Tarantino wants to, uh, in my opinion, you know, he's looking to do something different. You know, like the scope, the way it's shot, you know, the cinematography. This is a film. Is it bloody? In some years, yes. Not as bloody as a Tarantino film, right. <laughs> um, but it, it has its commercial value. Well, here's a one that I'm really looking forward to. It's Snowden. This is Oliver Stone's Snowden. Uh, uh, obviously, you all have heard of Edward Snowden, uh, the NSA uh, spy that fled to Russia. So Oliver Stone made the movie with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Uh, I, I feel not only is it one of the better movies coming out for this fall, uh, but this is a film that has the vintage Oliver Stone feel to it. Gordon Levitt is constantly delivering. Is probably one of the better actors we have in Hollywood. Yeah, it could be. Uh, I think for anybody who saw the documentary that won the Oscar, um, you're going to be at least you're going to be familiar with this story. You know, for those who who are who you know who have not read about Snowden, you know, you're, you're going to walk in there and wonder like, what's going on. But in today's world, when you're, whenever you're going shopping um, from Starbucks to Wegmans and you have to you know, throw in your card, you, know, you say to yourself, there's a record of everything you're doing. What are the second ones that, that you feel are, uh, are top of mind? I think The Girl on the Train. Um, it's a movie starring Emily Blunt, which is based on a bestseller. And, by Paula uh, Hawkins. By right? Paula Hawkins. And it's directed by Tay Taylor, who did The Help. And I think when you looked about, about two years ago, with Gone Girl. Oh my God, it has the same vibe. I it's just got like it was say, a sequel, right? And audiences want to see a thriller. You know, when it comes to Oscar time and it comes to fall season, you get a lot of depressing movies. You get a lot of biopics. You get these stories that like, I don't want to see a depressing movie. I already, got, I already know about this guy's life story. But I want to see an old-fashioned thriller in which I don't know where it's going to go. With a Hitchcockian feel is yes. what Girl on a Train and Gone Girl kind of feel like by David Fincher. If you read the book, you just want to see the visualness of it. And if you haven't read the book, you want to be intrigued by what where the story is going to take you. Uh, my film, and I'm shocked that it's not a part of your list yet. Maybe it is, but I don't think so. It's Birth of a Nation. I mean, this movie's coming out October 7th. And it is the lock, as you said before, for the front runner to win Best Picture at the Oscars in 2017. Nate Parker, this is his masterpiece, man. And not only is it his masterpiece, it might be the masterpiece of the year. Have You haven't had a chance to see it, you said. I right? haven't had a chance to see it. Uh, I hope to see it in Toronto. And as you mentioned, you know, like, the question is, can people separate the art from the artist? I think if you take the artist away, you're talking about the art. And from, from get-go, from Sundance to now, it's always been about the art. Here's a story where they're fighting back, you know, where it's about survival. Um, I won't say more because I haven't seen it. But, you know, from all indications, you know, I think it's going to be a one to see on your end. All right. So what do you got? I have La La Land. It's directed by Damien Chazelle, who did Whiplash. Dude, Whiplash is still one of my favorite films of the last 10 years, man. Easy. It's his love letter to Hollywood and Los Angeles, starring Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. It just played at the Venice Film Festival to rave reviews. Uh, from what I read, Standing O just after the first 10 minutes. Um, I feel like it's a bit of a sequel to Crazy Stupid Love. If you kind of just said to yourself, what would happen if these two characters got together and sort of like left that plot line from Crazy Stupid Love and went into their own plot line? They fell in love in Crazy Stupid Love. Now in La La Land, they're sort of uh, concluding that love. But it also has tinges of 500 uh, days of summer. 
Remember that movie where there was these musical parts, but all attached with a quirky romance? So if you combined Crazy Stupid Love and 500 Days of Summer, then you probably have a really good sense of what La La Land is. But uh, another pick that I have that I'm really excited to see, I saw the trailer about maybe two weeks ago, and I was floored. It's Mel Gibson's Hacksaw Ridge. Have you heard about this film? I have. It's a, tr- it's, it's, it's a true life story about the soldier who went to war and would never want to fire a shot, didn't want to have a gun, and he was able to save the lives of his of his comrades. You know, seventy two, right? Uh, comrades that he uh, f- that that uh, he saved in World War Two. Uh, he's a medic, and one of the great things about this is that he has some very strict religious beliefs uh, of not to kill, not to use any violence. But if you're in the middle of World War Two, yeah. Uh, it becomes extremely difficult not to be able to at least defend yourself or, or protect yourself in any way in terms of danger. And this is what the movie's plot is all about. And I thought it was genius. Uh, you know Mel Gibson can direct an amazing movie. He's done it before. Uh, he's a really talented guy. And I think it goes back to the Nate Parker, Woody Allen, Roman Polanski issue is can you separate the man from the art? I was and- just going to say that. You know, Mel Gibson obviously has his... Uh- I want to say enemies, his detractors, because of the fact that, you know, he was also involved in a situation where he lost a big fan base. All right, so what else do you have on your end? I have Fences, which is... The Denzel Washington! Denzel film. Washington, Viola Davis. Denzel directed it based on an adapted screenplay by Tony uh, Kushnick, uh, who did Angels in America. Uh, this is based on the Tony Award-winning play by August Wilson, and when you have Denzel in a movie and Viola together, and these are the two actors who won Tony Awards for their performances on Broadway, uh, you know, if the writing's on the wall from a stage to screen, it's another Oscar contender. See, that's that's what I love about the fall lineups, man. I mean, it really begins after Labor Day. It's almost it's almost like Hollywood gets serious. We're gonna we're gonna bring our A game films. Even though I thought August were, was probably one of the best August sort of months for Hollywood, in I don't know maybe in history. Yeah. Why well, don't? Here's the thing about August. August is usually like a throwaway month, like you know but, movies. But, see, but not not this year though. That that whole that whole, this 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 whole month has been redefined by Florence Foster Jenkins, Heller see, Highwater, that's whole South Side by You. You were talking about movies that necessarily are not about making money, but having good reviews I mean, like you mentioned Florin Foster Jenkins you know Hell or High Water which hopefully can muster up the strength by its studio to make a run for best picture Variety thinks it's the best picture of the year well I, I think I, I don't know about year so far but I think definitely a contender because you walk in that movie and you know I, I didn't even know it's already in theaters and it'll be gone uh, pretty soon um, you didn't know what to expect and it's CBS Films, and CBS Films has not had a, has not had that history of, of bringing out not like, like A twenty four, right? A the quality studio. films, right? But when you have Jeff Bridges, uh, 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 you know Ben Foster, Ben Foster, who's so, unrecognizable in this film, Chris Pine, in his best work to date, take away the commercial Star Trek films, this is his best work to date. Wow, just the three of them together, and to see that story unfold, you're just that is good, old fashioned, western. Entertainment, right, right. No, this is this is. Uh, if you guys haven't seen it, Hell or High Water is really one of the legit, real deal films of this year. Uh, it came out in August. It just kind of was like the the surprise hit, probably of the year, right? What did you say? Yes, definitely. It's not like I said before. It's not about making money. It's not landing in number one. But I think what people want to see when they're reading the papers on Friday is like, what's worth seeing? They got, they were so tired of seeing horror films, all these other movies that had expectations but ended up getting one or two stars. All right, so here's my last movie that I feel uh, we have to talk about. Uh, It's a Spanish film uh, for those Spanish-language speakers and that love their international films. It's Pedro Almodovar's brand-new film, Julieta. Now, from everything I've been hearing, this is the best film Almodovar has done in the last 10 years. You know that his last couple of movies have been a bit of a flop, haven't had the acclaim and the respect. Uh, they thought that Almodovar just hasn't been focusing on creating sort of the vintage Almodovar films. He's been sort of just experimenting, kind of just getting a couple of uh, things off his chest that weren't necessarily um, focused on, on prestige, but more along the lines of just distractions. 
but it really has the the imprint of Almodovar all over. And as soon as you see it, it's going to remind you of those great 90s films that he used to do. Yes, I actually have seen the movie. Wait, wait, you saw who I've seen that? I've seen the film. Uh, it's a throwback. You know, it's Almodovar from his old days. If you loved All About My Mother, this is in the same vein. It's a story, you know, like you mentioned before, his last few films, you just didn't care. They were, they were fluff. They were like, it, it, he's, he's walking through these movies. Whereas Julieta, um, you're watching it unfold because there's a story there about a woman trying to uh, get in touch with her daughter who she hasn't seen in years. And you're seeing two stories. You're seeing what led to the event of why, you know, of why her daughter and her are no longer talking and, you know, uh, compared to the present tense, you know, her going through trying to find her daughter. So there's two stories going involved. You have two actresses playing the same character. Um, and, you know, it's Emma Dovar. It's like when you watch this movie, you just want to be intrigued. You know, um, he's got Rosie De Palma, who's been a staple in all. Of, and I wouldn't say all his films. But if there's always one person you wanted to see in, his, in all his movies, it's Rosie De Palma, and she's in there. <laughs> so like, you're good to go. That's his muse. <laughs> that is great because his muse for a long time was Penelope Cruz. I know he brought Antonio Banderas back in. I mean, he's really been recalling a lot of the actors that start off with him in the beginning of his career. Uh, but this is a really great way to round out his body of work. Everybody's really talking about uh, this film as one of the better films of the year. Uh, and I, I can't wait to see it. I have a screening next week. And... Uh, and those are the films that, to me, are, are the top must-see films for this fall movie preview. It was one more. Oh, you got one more? Yeah, we, yeah I think the, 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 my fifth one was Rogue One, a Star Wars story. See, that's a predictable sort of popcorn film that doesn't have the cachet of the Star Wars uh, but that's the whole or point. the Force Awakens franchise. And that's the thing. It's the beauty of it. It's like, now you're taking off. Now, after 20, 30 years, someone decide, finally decided, you know what? Let's make a standalone. Let's just take, you know, yeah, a they're spinning it off almost off of the. It's a spinoff. Let's franchise. take a character. Let's have elements of obviously, you know, Star Wars in there. You know, different time frame, new actors. Uh, although I did hear that uh, uh, James Earl Jones will be coming back to reprise his role as Darth Vader, um, and you don't know what to expect. You know, they don't know what to expect. You know, they well, don't have. There's the... been a couple of problems I've heard with the film so far in terms of they, they're either reshooting a couple of uh, scenes or sequences. Uh, something hasn't been working. I've been hearing. You know, the, the, the first the thing about the first movie that they did two years, last year that came out, The Force Awakens, that you had the benefit of having fan favorites back: Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill. Right, the nostalgia aspect. You know, along with some new actors here. You're going with actors who you're not familiar with. You oh, know? my God. We have Diego Luna. I mean, look, the, the thing about this one is it's a little too over the head. We're going to make sure that we have a female lead so we can please the female crowds, so we can be in touch with the multicultural aspects of today's world. It just seems to all so nicely fit with a little bow tie so people don't criticize and complain the film. But I actually think that it's not necessarily as authentic. It all, it all depends, you know, you know, we're going with today's times, and in today's times is they want to see females in these leads. You know, over the years, people have complained of the lack of roles for females, you know, in these type, in these type of tentpole films. You know, with the exception of Sigourney Weaver, who, or, or Mila Jovinovich, <laughs> we haven't had one in, in a, such a long time, and I think, you know, uh, to that magnitude, and I think they wanted to bring it back. And, you know, they started off with somebody new. Uh, like I said, you got, you got a cast of new actors. And, you know, so they don't know what they're going to get here. So they've got to go all out, especially since The Force Awakens did a, a nearly two, nearly two and a half billion dollars. Right. So you can't go from nearly making nearly two and a half billion dollars to just making under a million, under a billion. Yeah, it would be a total flop and failure, which I actually think it might. It might. It might be under a billion dollars. I mean, man, look how we're talking about it. Like, you know, it's a flop. But I guess in their standards, it's all very relative. I don't think this movie's going to do that well, man. You know, I, I, sometimes a good thing about some of these movies is you just want to be surprised. You know, the, Kind of like the, Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, there's, there's anticipation, what to expect. And then there's like, I don't want to know so much. I just want to see it as it is and let, it, let, me, be, let me learn something. So just to kind of wrap up, uh, I know there's been a lot of movies that we haven't uh, talked about here just because of lack of time. There's just too many to talk about. But uh, worth mentioning, there's so many great movies like Sully coming out September 16th. 
Oh, September 9th, I'm sorry. Uh, you got Ben Affleck's The Accountant. The Founder is a movie that I would have mentioned here, but because of the release dates being constantly moved by the Weinstein Company and Michael Keaton's Tour de Force performance here, I- I'm hesitant to include it in the fall movie preview. They're saying that it's going to have like a larger spinoff come, come January. Uh, but that's a movie I'm, I think could actually win Best Picture, be the biggest contender for Birth of a Nation. Uh, Monster Calls with uh, Liam Neeson by Juan Antonio Bayona, who directed Jurassic World. He's a director from Spain. Tom Cruise's Jack Reacher, Never Go Back. Arrival seems like a great sci-fi thriller with Amy Adams. Uh, Fantastic Beasts uh, and Where to Find Them, which is this Warner Brothers sort of like rebooting of the Harry Potter franchise. Manchester by the Sea, Casey Affleck. I- I'm hearing it's, wonders about this film. I'm hearing from uh, you know a couple of Oscar prediction websites that it's a top three. Wow, so you got Birth of a Nation, Birth of a Nation, well, Manchester I, you know, by like, the Sea, probably. If I had to, if I had to start going by estimates right now or guesses, I would say Manchester by the Sea, a lot of the land, Birth of a Nation. From what's been seen and what's been talked about, right, right. And then we also have other movies that are coming out, Nocturnal Animals. Now, uh, a lot of you might not have heard about this, this film, but uh, Tom Ford, the fashion icon, is directing this film, his sophomore film or probably his third film, it's Amy Adams, Jake Gyllenhaal, Michael Shannon. Uh, this comes out November 18th. It's a bit of a thriller. Then there's Allied with Brad Pitt um, in, in this film, and he shot this in uh, near Mallorca, Spain, where I was, in Port Andrash. Uh, World War II uh, tone as well. Rules don't apply. It's Warren Beatty's comeback after 15 years. It looks great. It has uh, the new Han Solo, Aldrin uh, Alden. Ironreich? Is that how you pronounce it like that? I didn't butcher his name. (laughs) Uh, Then there's Miss Sloan with Jessica Chastain. It's about uh, the gun control debate coming out in December. Then Neruda with Gael Garcia Bernal. This is about the uh, poet uh, from Chile. Collateral Beauty, Will Smith, Helen Mirren. No trailer, no plot line. No one's giving out any information. So we're kind of in the dark with that one. Then there's Passengers, which is the big film everybody's waiting for from Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, We talk about Fences, but then Gold. Matthew McConaughey, Christmas Day with Edgar Ramirez and Bryce Dallas Howard about these guys that literally go to Indonesia to find gold, come back to Wall Street, uh, whether they become rich or not is part of the plot line. But I, I, I think we, we can pick 10 films from here at some point, right? Yeah, that, are, that are top Oscar contenders. Yeah, you can definitely pick out 10. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be something that no one's talked about yet. I remember last year at this time, going to Toronto, no one was talking about Spotlight or Room. It's and incredible, it, right? And after that, all of a sudden, Spotlight became the film to beat. And, and it won, ultimately. Brie Larson was, you know, a train that no one could stop. You know, so she was it. You know, and she beat out perennial contenders like Kate Blanchett and Jennifer Lawrence. And, you know, we'll see who's, who's going to be this year's favorite. Wilson, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Where can people uh, reach you on uh, social media? They can find me over at blackfilm.com, which is the same words you use for Facebook as well as Twitter. And before I go, I leave you with three shows to watch over the Labor Day weekend. Netflix's Addictive Narcos Season 2 and the Artistic Culinary Universe of Chef's Table Season 3, France. Plus, on Labor Day Monday, you have to see Comedy Central's Roast of Rob Lowe. Or should I say, Ann Coulter. I spoke about it with Kathleen Hoda on the Today Show. Rob Lowe was getting roasted this week. Yeah. Not about as it. much as um, uh, Ann Coulter. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He got lashed on his sex tape, on how handsome he is, all the shows that were canceled. But the worst lashing was oddly towards Ann Coulter, to the point that it was so obvious that Ann Coulter, when she got on uh, stage, she said, uh, welcome to the Ann Coulter roasting featuring Rob Lowe. And that's a wrap for the fourth episode of Highly Relevant. I want to thank my good friends Willie Geis and Wilson Morales for coming on the show, plus director Richard Tanney. And I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any suggestions on how I can improve the show, please email me at highlyrelevant at showbizcafe.com. That's highlyrelevant at showbizcafe.com. Also, if you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and please subscribe, rate it, and leave a review. It makes a major difference in reaching a wider audience. We're also now on Stitcher and SoundCloud too for you Android users. See you again next Friday on another episode of Highly Relevant.